We are front running all these institutions that normally are in way in front of us. Bitcoin is about ready to explode. People that think that we've touched an all time high, I guarantee you that is not the case. All the charts right now are just kind of sitting there right where they should be. I believe that we'll see a million dollars for a Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the greatest monetary invention in the history of mankind. If you look at that S curve with the internet right now for Bitcoin, it's like 1999. And I was there in 1999. You know, the internet was something that we were all going to use to send mail to each other. It rapidly expanded into something that none of us could have imagined. That's where Bitcoin is. It's 1999. We're about 5% adoption. We're in uh, wave one here. This is a new asset class that's going to take over all of investment portfolios. This is your opportunity. You want to get as much Bitcoin as you can. Choose wisely your purchases, your career choices right now. Do as much as you can to maximize that stack. You will be rewarded in the future. Bitcoin does not generate yield. Everything that you get that generates return on Bitcoin is pairing some type of risk. We are that internet based layer to AI. Bitcoin that it took for me to purchase that same house was now 44 Bitcoin. So it went from 600 to 44. Do you know what it is today? It's seven Bitcoin. You don't need real estate anymore. Real estate has so many counterparty risks. Hi, George. How are you doing? Everything fine on your end? I'm doing good. I'm uh, looking forward to this. Um, I think this will be an important discussion today for uh, both seasoned Bitcoin holders, my fellow plebs, but even people that are new to this space. I've got, uh, you know, my goal here is to make this something that's that can help people going forward, because I think we're in a very challenging time in front of us. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about this, but I think there's quite of important events that are coming our way. Oh, interesting. Um, before we get to this, because it's already uh, uh, sounding very interesting, I just want to get uh, people to understand like how, how your background is, because I think like usually I'm not the podcaster that asks, like, oh, please introduce yourself, because usually the, the question is quite boring for me. But I think in your case, it's actually quite interesting because you have done so many different things uh, and experienced your life in so many different ways. Uh, so I think it could be interesting for the viewers. Okay, what have you done? Uh, what was your past? Uh, and what what did you experience? Uh, what also maybe influenced your thinking now about Bitcoin? Well, it's true that this is, I'm a very, uh, I have an unusual background, uh, especially in the way that it brought me to Bitcoin. Um, you know, I grew up uh, just in the 70s back in uh, Colorado. And from there, uh, I went to uh, uh, college and ended up dropping out. This was up in Wyoming. Uh, actually, I had already been, um, I had left high school. I, actually, I was expelled from high school, uh, which is, I think it's called gymnasium, as I mentioned, maybe in Germany, or it's when you're about 17, 18 years old. And for the European viewers, uh, you know, this means the next step is uh, university, college, we call it here. And uh, I, un unfortunately, it was for uh, fighting at, at, in those days, and it was uh, with a teacher. So I'm very fortunate, you know, timings, everything. Today, I think if I had engaged in the behavior I did then, I, I probably would have been incarcerated. So, but they just expelled me from high school. And my parents, uh, I just, my parents were really a great support group. They advised me that I probably should not go back. Uh, so at this time, I got very interested in aviation. I'd always loved planes and I started ferrying airplanes around the United States. I was 17 years old. I was out of high school. I didn't really have any skill set, but I wanted to build time. And if you know anything about flying, that's really a key component. You have to build hours in a plane in order to get qualifications. So this guy that I was flying for was like a used car dealer, but he was dealing in planes uh, out in Colorado. He would buy planes sight unseen. I would get on a Greyhound bus. I'd go up to wherever it was, often on a grass strip, get in the plane, try and read the owner's manual, get familiar with it, and then take off and bring the plane back to him. Um, so it was an interesting experience, but I did that and I got my hours. I actually got my license. Uh, I got a commercial license, but the thing is that you couldn't really do anything with it without college. 
so I went uh, went to college uh, up in Wyoming. I ended up dropping out, <laughs> and I started working in the oil fields up there in Wyoming. Uh, in, in and it was a very difficult job, as you can imagine. From there, I then went. I, I became a cop. I uh, was a city cop for quite a while, and uh, after that, uh, again, I just couldn't seem to find a place that I fit in well and ended up uh, working underground as a miner. Uh, I went back to Colorado and worked on a hard rock mine, deep mine. I mean, I was down, I worked down probably as far as two miles down. It was so far down that when you get in the, you guys would call it an elevator, but we called it a cage. And it was like a cage. You got in this cage, they slammed the door shut, sent you down there. And it took, it took 10 minutes for the cage to get to the bottom of the shaft. And in fact, it was so long, the cable was stretched so long that when you got to the bottom of the shaft, they would stop it. The guy would stop it. But you just keep right on going. That cable would stretch out. You'd see the you'd see your level go right past you and you'd go right down. It would stop and then it would ease itself back up. It'd go above and then it'd go down. It took about six to seven times before it would stop and you could step off the cage into the drift. That's not a tunnel. We call them drifts. And then I worked down there and, you know, it, it became very obvious to me after a while that, you know, my life was not going anywhere. And so I asked my parents, I said, uh, you know, if I would you let me live in your basement and would you put me back? Would you pay for my tuition so I can go to college? And at the time uh, they said yes. And so I drove a cab at night in Denver uh, to make money. And I actually did really well doing that. Uh, it put, I had money for all the time I was going through college. And then I graduated right at that time. Oh, oh, something really unusual is that the U S Navy, uh, and the military in general were really hurting for pilots. Uh, and I applied, obviously I'd already knew how to fly. So I, I got in, I got accepted. Uh, it was very difficult to get in. Uh, I went through a program called, uh, well, if you've ever, you're probably not, anyone that's older has probably seen that movie, Officer and a Gentleman. That's the kind of training I went through down uh, there and did. You just show up, uh, they shave your head, they start screaming at you. They're all Marine DIs. Uh, most of the time when I was there, they were all from Vietnam, Vietnam vets. And they were a pretty tough lot. So uh, I went through that. Because of my flying experience, I ended up uh, graduating number one in that, that particular class. So I got to pick whatever I wanted to do and where I wanted to go. And I ended up in F-18s, Hornets, uh, which if you watch the last Top Gun movie, that's what they're flying. They're flying F-18s. And uh, after that, I, uh, in fact, speaking of Top Gun, I, I went through Top Gun and then I became an instructor, an adversary instructor, they called them. I went up to Nevada and flew as a Top Gun adversary instructor, uh, simulating uh, Russian planes and tactics, that kind of thing. Um, then I got hired by Delta, again, because of the flying experience, and uh, ended up, uh, I worked there for a long time. I became a captain and flew there. But unfortunately, I had a motorcycle accident. Uh, I was really into motorcycles all my life, and I built my own a uh, chopper uh, back several years ago, and it was a really neat project. I mean, my my now wife was dating me, and she first met me. She walked in the house. I had the chopper. I had the engine on the table, the dining room table. I was working on it, building. I had the frame out there. I had welded inside my house, house making the frame up. So uh, unfortunately, it was I, I got hurt on that motorcycle, and I had a a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. It ended my flying career and really kind of started this journey of where I am today, which I began working full time as an artist. Um, and if you remember, you know, the GFC, you know, the 2008 crisis, that changed a lot of things for many people. And for I was one of them. I had a really tough time during that period because investments, a pension, a lot of different things that were going on. And I realized that I had to become my own financial inv advisor, investor, my RIA. I had to be my hedge fund manager. I took that role on and I started studying finance really deep. 
Um, I was exposed to Bitcoin in 2012, and I immediately, I thought it was a Ponzi scheme, a scam. It didn't make any sense. I had built computers with parts, and I, I thought, well, computers always break. You'll never keep your Bitcoin. I just didn't understand it. So it was a hard pass. And then, unfortunately, I didn't do any studying afterwards. Um, I wish I had. But 2017, Lynn Alden, uh, I was on Seeking Alpha quite a bit, studying macro and stuff. She had an article on uh, Bitcoin, and it was a great article. She did a wonderful job. But at the same time, I could tell that she passed, meaning she was interested in it, but it wasn't time for her to invest in it. Um, unbeknownst to me, she continued to study it very hard, and, and I didn't. I read her article, and I said, ah, again, you know, it's, it's not going to, I'm not sure it's going to make it. Well, 2020, she came out with another article, like in January, so about four and a half years ago. And this time, I could tell she, she was in. Uh, I'm not saying she was all in, but the article changed my viewpoint. And then I went down the rabbit hole. So she started it. But after that, I mean, I've probably got, I don't know how many hours. It could be 1,500, 2,000. I don't know how many hours I have studying Bitcoin. But I orange-pilled myself after that. And uh, and today, <laughs> I'm, I'm all in on Bitcoin. I, I love that a lot. It's also the, your story is so interesting because... Uh, it, it teaches uh, self-studying, self-educating a lot. And I think with, with Bitcoin, this <laughs> is kind of necessary because it will take a long time till the mainstream will educate people on Bitcoin. I mean, maybe BlackRock is, is, is trying to do that a little bit now, but it's it's a small group of people uh, with some podcasts, with some articles, with some books. The, the, the resources are now way better than 2017 or even to, uh, 2020, uh, but it's still a, a niche thing uh, and, and we're still just like starting out. It's really interesting to, to, to see your uh, uh, um, reasoning also. Uh, why did uh, Bitcoin then resonate uh, so strongly with you when you read the article and what was it uh, that stood out for you? Well, you know, what, what you said is really important. We This asymmetry of information that that my fellow plebs out there and yourself, that what we have is a tremendous power here. Um, and I began to realize that that this asset would become an asset class, and it is. Uh, that's very important as an investor. Uh, there are only, you know, usually there, if you ask people, uh, uh, an investment advisor to list asset class, he'll come up with about eight of them. Uh, and Bitcoin is the newest. <clears throat> and think about what that means. That, that means that it's an, a, a new asset class that people are going to start investing in widespread. So this idea that we have a, a symmetry of power through our study and information is something that I realized was very unique. You don't sell, you don't get this. You know, all of us out there that are into Bitcoin and those of you who are new, we are front running all these institutions that normally are in way in front of us, these centers of financial power that are close to the Cantillion effect. They have the ability to uh, capitalize on that information doesn't matter whether it's BlackRock, if it's institutions such as pension funds, hedge fund managers, family offices, all of these institutions normally have a tremendous advantage over us, but they don't this time. If you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to study and understand what you hold, then you are in a very unique position that seldom comes around. So for me, that conviction, that that is what led me to to think to myself, this is an unusual asset that's once in a lifetime. And I mean that. Um, that kind of sums up how I feel about the asset. Uh, there are some other things I'd like to talk about, though, as far as our asymmetry of information and how important this time is. Absolutely. Very really cool. Um, is that kind of... I mean, you have uh, 68 years. I think uh, you, you said that uh, uh, you're young now. Um, do you think that's the biggest or greatest opportunity you you ever saw right now? I do. There, there is nothing uh, that I've ever seen like this. For instance, 
you know, as I mentioned, from 2008 on, I've been studying finances and assets, macro, trying to invest. And uh, maybe it's because I'm an artist, but the very first time I ever saw Bitcoin in a log chart, price time in log form, the very first time I ever saw it, I was blown away. I, I looked at the chart and I thought, this is unlike anything I have ever seen before. There's no asset. There's no stock. There's no equity. There's no commodity. I've never seen anything with that pattern. It was almost like math. Um, and so it just blew me away and it furthered my conviction. Um, you know, right now, this is a really important time that we're in. Bitcoin is about ready to explode. People that think that we've touched an all-time high, there I, I guarantee you that is not the case. Um, first off, let's make sure that we understand that anything I said today, say today is not financial advice. I'm often wrong in finance. Sometimes I come out like a village idiot. I have no issues with that. But the but the bottom line is that that I am convinced we are on the cusp of a new cycle. Uh, I just checked a lot of the charts. I, I'm really big into on-chain analysis. Uh, all the charts right now are just kind of sitting there right where they should be. There's no, even the open interest right now, I think it's around maybe 15%. Uh, you know, it, it sometimes it gets as high as 55% in the last cycle top, this, this recent one to 73,000. It's nowhere. Most of the charts, if you look at them, uh, when you get up to like two to three standard deviations above the mean, that's a time to be concerned. None of that's happening. So everything's just sitting here. We're coiled spring. We're ready to go. I highly recommend to the viewers out there that there's only two subscriptions that I maintain uh, right now. Even though I'm fully committed to Bitcoin, all my wealth is in Bitcoin or one proxy. And... Uh, these two sources that I follow, I, I use James Check, which you've had him on your podcast before, I, I believe, from Australia. Uh, he maintains on Substack. Yeah, Check uh, made that on. Check, chain, uh, check on Chain. And for free, he has an entire suite of these charts that you can familiarize yourself with. And the only other thing that I do is I uh, subscribe to uh, Lynn Alden's premium subscription. It's not very expensive, but it, just for the macro viewpoint. But what I'm going to say is that, you know, you, we're going to see an explosion here in the remaining of this cycle. And we've got about one more cycle before that train is gone. And that means, you know, in six to eight years, I, I believe that we'll see a million dollars for a Bitcoin, a million dollar Bitcoin in six to eight years. I'm convinced of it. So when I say it's a train, what I'm saying is that we're standing on a platform right now, all of us, you and I actually and my fellow plebs out there, some of us are on the train. We're holding a ticket. We're ready to go. Uh, we're looking out there at all the platform and we see all these people that we think are going to get left behind. And, you know, that's why we often become so anxious about trying to convince our family members or the people that we love, our friends, our close acquaintances to get on board the Bitcoin train because we know what's going to happen. And there are people joining all the time. Adoption is increasing. We're at about 5% probably now, like 1999 as far as internet adoption. And we want those people with us. We And, and some people have got the train window open. They're yelling out into the platform, hey, get on board. But soon the train's leaving. And if you've ever watched people that, that are going to miss their train, some of them will step on board. You can at the last second. You can get on board just at the last minute. Some people... If you've ever seen it, you know, they'll try to run along with the train and you can run with the train for a little while. But eventually that train's going to pick up speed and you're going to see the end of it disappearing in the distance. Now, for those who say, uh, well, George, you know, I can buy in, in eight years, you know, when Bitcoin's a million dollars a coin, I can still buy sats. I can buy, you know, a thousand dollars worth of sats. That's true. But what I'm trying to talk about is generational wealth. What, what you can create right now is incredible and it is an opportunity. And, you know, for me, I've stopped trying to orange pill people uh, directly. I just have given up uh, in my family. Uh, really, only one person got it. And, and 
the good news is he's stacked, stacked like a son of a bitch, and he's he's probably set. But I'm just going to create generational wealth for the people that I love. And then when I'm gone, there'll be another train come along and they can step on board that platform then. I, I, I love that analogy so much. It's 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 really good. And also the the orange peeling, the the loft ones, I think we we kind of have to start stacking so hard that we can be there for our loved ones that are right now not willing to get on the train if we tried everything in our power to orange pill them because sometimes you're just out of the power and you cannot orange pill them and you should not force them to do anything especially financially not um even though if bitcoin is a great success it's st probably still not a good idea for your relationship with them um but it's really interesting the the idea of a train leaving and also like this mm -hmm this special window that we are currently in. Um, why, why do you think is right now that the time so uh, valuable to get into Bitcoin? Why is like the next few years, the, the, the time where, where Bitcoin uh, is about to break out? You also mentioned before in a, in a side sen sentence that you think there's challenging times ahead of us. Uh, what do you mean with, with all that? Well, getting to the first point here, um, We've had that unique opportunity, those of us that have been in here early and have been studying, but quite frankly, that that symmetry is it's changing. You know, if you look at just what's happened over the last year, if you look since January with the adoption, the ETFs that have come onto the market, if you look at uh, the accounting rule changes, uh, FASB rules are going to come in effect January 1st. So we're only a couple months away from that. Uh, that's huge. That is going to mean that every company out there on planet Earth is going to be using this new best practices for uh, how they report Bitcoin on their balance sheets. And quite frankly, right now, it's treated as an intangible uh, property or asset. One of the worst ways it could be treated. It's one of the things that's held back corporate adoption. Well, that's going to be gone. And when it's gone, you are going to see a lot more treasuries begin to stack Bitcoin. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, BlackRock's recent uh, investor newsletter or their talk that they recently gave, uh, they're they're getting it. They understand it, and they're not alone. You know, Fidelity has been mining Bitcoin since I think around 2015. They've been mining Bitcoin. They're they're deep into the Bitcoin hole. They're one of only two companies that are actually self-custodying their Bitcoin, uh, all the rest of them are using Coinbase. So there's deep knowledge here, it's it's coming. And that, uh, that asset class designation is very important. It means that RIAs, uh, uh, hedge funds, mutual funds, pension, pension funds are gonna start uh, dipping their toe in here. Wisconsin just put in 155, million dollars into Bitcoin. And for them, that is one tenth of 1% of their investable assets. So what they're doing is they're sticking their little toe in there to see if it's hot or not. And once they're in there and they begin to see the returns, they probably won't rebalance that. In fact, they'll probably increase that exposure. So what's coming is going to, it's going to rock your world it's going to be a come to Jesus moment for a lot of people. So I'm, I'm still a believer in the four year cycle. Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen that broken yet, but we only have three cycles to watch that. And we don't really know where this is going. And if you look, if you look at adoption of technology, so Bitcoin is the greatest monetary invention in the history of mankind. But it's also the greatest technological monetary investment or uh, invention. And what that means is if it's on a technological adoption curve, we normally refer to that as an S curve. And as I mentioned, if you look at that S curve with the Internet right now for Bitcoin, it's like 1999. And I was there in 1999. I remember what it was like. You know, the Internet was something that we were all going to use to send mail to each other. We we're going to stop writing letters and we we're going to use mail. Well, there it rapidly ex expanded into something that none of us, very few of us 
could have imagined. Well, that's where Bitcoin is. It's 1999. We're about 5% adoption. It's like we're in, uh, you know, wave one here. And if, if, if this is an S curve, this next cycle might actually break that four year cycle. And if it's not this one, it might be the next one. I don't know. Again, I don't know the future. I just know that we are about ready to take off. And it's important for all of you out there, my fellow plebs, my my fellow Bitcoiners, new Bitcoiners, anyone that you are able to talk to, it, this is a very important period right now. Absolutely. It's a... Uh... It's it's the it's the greatest uh, opportunity that I have ever seen. But my life is very short; <laughs> like I have twenty five years, basically, uh, if you count even like the first years. But uh, it's it's very impressive to see people that uh, above <laughs> sixty. Sometimes I even had people on above seventy. I think the the oldest one was seventy six, uh, I, I believe, or is seventy six, uh, I believe. Uh, so like. When, when those people who have the context uh, of the dot com bubble of this, all those amazing technology advancements from the, the landline phone to the cell phone and all those, those uh, technology advancements where they actually lived through that and saw the opportunities and the possibilities there, they're like, oh, like that's Bitcoin right now. Like that's, that's the thing you have to pay attention to right now in that generation at that time at 2024, 2025. Uh, that gives me a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, confidence and a lot of, uh, confirmation in, in that exactly what I, what I believe in. Uh, so that, I, I love that, uh, that, uh, you bring it like, like that here. Well, thank you. You know, I uh, really had cool. a chance to, sit with uh like just like this one-on-one -on -one with bill miller i don't know if the the senior the dad i don't know if you know who he is but he's a you know a, a brilliant investor a billionaire and you know when you get a chance to just sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk to somebody like that you, you do a lot of listening and one of the things that he told me as almost sage advice is the fact that he had been into bitcoin for a long time they had continued to believe and stack Bitcoin, and they had never sold Bitcoin. Think about that. That's very unusual. So it's not an investment that he's thinking about turning over. He sees it the same way. This is generational wealth. And if we're correct in what we're saying here, and, and this is a new asset class that's going to take over all of investment portfolios, all of the assets out there that are that investable, we probably have like maybe hundreds, $900 trillion of investable assets out there. It just, that figure depends upon what you consider investable. But the thing is that much of that is going to go into Bitcoin. So although I'm sitting here in my studio and in my chair, I like to think of this as like a three-legged stool that we're on. And the, the three-legged stool is a very stable platform. It's been in use. It's one of the oldest pieces of furniture in the history of mankind. It's been uh, used for millennia. You can find a stool in Tutankhamun's tomb <laughs> in the pyramids. So it's been used forever, and it's and for a reason. It, if you look at it and you think of it that way, the, the most important thing right now is to, to get Bitcoin, to stack as much Bitcoin as you can like a psychopath. Uh, it, you know, I know that you passed up on a, a purchasing a house, and, and I think that was a very wise decision. This narrow window we have, you, this is not a time when you want to be out. Uh, you know, I love watches, but at the same time, and I know you have watches that you love too, I'm very careful about how I allocate my assets. Every purchase is important. Now, for me personally, I'm in a position now where I don't need any more uh, Bitcoin. I don't want any more Bitcoin. Um, I, I have an, enough, you know, I want Bitcoin to spread around. I want other people to have Bitcoin too. Um, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Kurt Vonnegut, uh, an author, or Joseph Heller, uh, who wrote Catch-22, wonderful book. Um, they were at a party one time given by a hedge fund billionaire. It was in Shelter Island. And this billionaire, obviously, was a wonderful party. And Kurt looked over at Joseph Heller, this successful, 
world-renowned artist and writer. And he said to him, he said, you know, look at that guy there. He, he has made more money in one day than you probably have made through all your royalties on your book. And he says, how does that make you feel? And Joseph said, I, I have something that he will never possess. I have enough. And what he meant was he could be satisfied. He, he didn't need to have more. But for my fellow plebs out there that are stacking, or for those who are new to this space, this is your opportunity. You want to get as much Bitcoin as you can. Um, and so choose widely, wisely your purchases, your career choices right now. Do as much as you can to maximize that stack. Uh, you will be rewarded in the future. And then, you know, if you think of the stool, the second leg on that stool is, it's very simple. All you have to do is just hodl. You know, all you have to do is just hold on to your Bitcoin. That's it. Now, I used to kind of stop the conversation there. I mean, that if you can just get Bitcoin, hold on to it, that's great. But the thing is that I've seen so many people lose their Bitcoin that I really think the third part, the third part of this stool is you have to keep that Bitcoin. You cannot lose the Bitcoin. And how do people lose it? They lose it through uh, exchanges, uh, leverage. This is really important, what I'm going to say right now. Bitcoin does not generate yield. I'll say it again. Bitcoin does not generate yield. There is no yield. If you own Bitcoin and it's on a wallet in cold storage, there is no yield. So everything that you get that generates return on Bitcoin from going forward is carrying some type of risk, some counterparty risk. You had one guest on here who lost his Bitcoin by lending it. It was, uh, I think it was Celsius was the platform. And, you know, I understand it, but at the same time, he went back twice to Celsius to generate a yield. And what did he earn? I mean, when you think about it, what Celsius was offering, it wasn't that much. And he risked his Bitcoin and lost it. Now, it's a great lesson, and I hope people take it well, but don't, don't use leverage to the point where you can be called mark to market the next day and lose your Bitcoin or on a weekend. Bitcoin trades 24-7 every time that you take risk where you don't have access to whatever that leveraged product is on the weekend or after in the evening, you're taking risk. Um, you're risking in cold storage. You, you know, even hardware wallets, who are you using for your hardware wallet? Uh, there is risk associated with all these different custody methods. Uh, even your your savings plan, your DCA plan is a risk. It can be. And I'll, I'll tell you why. If I'm right that Bitcoin is going to water eyes in the future, what is going to happen to Bitcoin in its scalability? Are, are you familiar with the uh, blockchain trilemma? Yeah, yeah. The, the scaling issues and the blockchain dilemma that you cannot have decentralization security in this. Exactly. And so, you know, when you think about it, those are three things you can have also. Now, Satoshi wisely chose as this base layer money for decentralization and security. And, and thank you, Satoshi. But that scalability issue is still there. And meaning that as we go forward, let's just say that Bitcoin is a million dollars a coin in eight years. That means that the block space, that block space, and even the mempool are going to become some of the most valuable real estate you can imagine. You are going to get to a point where ordinary people that are out there right now watching this are not going to be able to act on the base layer or they're going to pay huge fees. This ordinal NFT thing that we went through recently, it's been a blessing in disguise. Uh, I don't know about you personally, but in this low fee environment, last time I checked, it was like 22 sats per V-byte. I have consolidated my UTXOs. I've put them together. 
Now, there are security trade-offs for that, but I know that in the future, it's going to be $500. It's going to be $1,000 someday to transact on the base layer. And mempool, you know, mempool is also a real estate space. Imagine, um, imagine that JP Morgan and all of these custodians, all of these ETF purchasers, all of these future banks that are coming because banks are coming, you know, JP Morgan, Larry Fink, he calls and he gets approval for uh, BNY to start custing Bitcoin, even though they're prohibited from doing it. So he, he has that pull. Well, you know what? Other banks are going to want that too. And it's coming. And when banks are custodians, imagine a future in two years from now, JP Morgan says, I need to transact on the base layer and through the mempool. I need my transaction included in the mempool. Well, guess what? They will pay whatever they need to, to get that transaction on there. So you, myself, we're going to be priced out if we're not conscious of this. For those of you out there are DCAing, uh, maybe $100, $25 at a time, you're stacking like this. You need to look at those UTXOs and you need to start getting them in some management profile that's going to allow you to interact on the base layer going forward. So even that policy is a way for you to lose your Bitcoin. How else do you lose your Bitcoin? Uh, you know, obviously, if you have poor security practices, calling for scams, uh, all of these things that I'm talking about, th this idea of holding your Bitcoin, stacking Bitcoin, not losing your Bitcoin. They all tie into one thing, and that is knowledge. Knowledge builds conviction. So why would I, at my age and with my Bitcoin that I have, why would I keep studying? Why do I keep spending hours reading about Bitcoin? Uh, not only is it fascinating, but because I know that it builds conviction. You know, in this last down cycle, this last four year cycle, I never sold a, I never sold one sat. I just kept buying. I mean, I bought all the way up to the top. I bought all the way down to the bottom. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the the Bitcoin way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much I, n I never stop. I, lo I love that a lot. And I just want to give that to the viewers right now because I think it's 
that's a topic, for example, I didn't know uh, much about before I even started the podcast and I learned about UTXO management. And I just wanted to quickly show this to the viewers. If you want to learn about UTXOs, there's like a one hour, 10 minutes masterclass kind of uh, with Wicked on here. Uh, he knows a lot about that topic. And that's a thing where I like just type in UTXO uh, in, in my, uh, in my uh, channel. Uh, and that's a thing that actually I think not too many really know about that. I think ma many are not aware of how dangerous that can be in the future and don't take advantage of that low fee time. I actually, because you said it like uh, one week ago, I did a, a big UTXO management uh, session for myself and consolidated a lot. Uh, there's always this um, like uh, you, you want to have big UTXO ch uh, chunks, but you also want to like don't combine UTXOs that you don't want to combine. So like, it's really like if, if you don't know about UTXO management, it's highly uh, recommended to check out some videos. There are a lot of great resources online. This one video is maybe a good starting point where I really try to make it beginner friendly. Uh, but it's but it's really important to get educated uh, on it. I love that you're also the, the self-educating uh, guy because there is a lot of ways how you can lose a Bitcoin, how you can make mistakes, but there are great resources out there. Like when you come in in 2012 and you lost your Bitcoin during 2012 and 2015, it's kind of understandable because all the, you, you had a lot of learning processes, but now we already know a lot. <laughs> the most things that we, we can lose your Bitcoin, we know about and we can avoid them and you can uh, uh, secure your setup in a better way. So uh, there's, there's now, I feel like there's no excuse to lose your Bitcoin at that point. Maybe there was 2012, but not in 2024. It's, it's, do you also see it like that? Well, you know, I, I don't want to sound too harsh about people that have, you know, suffered in this last cycle, because, you know, let's just, let's think about it for a minute. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is a very difficult subject to understand. And a lot of the terms that we use and that terms that the developers employed, I wish that we would have had a good marketing team uh, at the time when they were coming up with some of these terms and ideas. UTXO. I mean, what a stupid idea. How do you explain UTXO to somebody? It's, it's very difficult. Um, you, you know, block space, mempool, all the terms that we use uh, in, that, in our Bitcoin space are very difficult I, to, to understand. They don't make a lot of sense. And, you know, when we talk about scalability, I do think that at some point in the future, we are going to see a lot of solutions that involve where they involve uh, applications, hardware, where we don't really understand the underlying technology. We just click and use. Uh, I don't know as far as scalability, whether lightning, for instance, is going to really be able to scale to the, the people on this planet. You know, there are 8 billion people on the planet. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you an idea of how difficult this is going to be in the future. There are only, in the entire Bitcoin network over a year, you're only going to have 150 million transactions. You might be able to scale that up to 200 million as people get more smart and, and their employment. But nonetheless, that's not much. With 8 billion people on the planet, that means if I, let's just say I had a hundred Bitcoin and I wanted to give away a little bit to every single person on the planet. Uh, Bob Burnett, the CEO of Barefoot Mining, just had a, uh, he just mentioned this on a podcast. So if I wanted to give that to every person in the world, it would take me, I think it was 150 years. It's astronomical. So Bitcoin on the base layer has to scale. And Satoshi knew this. Even Hal Finney talks about this. Whether Lightning can do that, I'm not sure. It could be a pegged sidechain. It could be something like a liquid. I'm a big fan of the Aqua Wallet, uh, something I just downloaded recently. I've been playing with it. You know, you've got uh, Bitcoin on it. You've got Tether. You've got uh, liquid Bitcoin. And uh, I think if I didn't say it, just BTC, but... What's neat about that, this pegged Bitcoin, 
is that it's fast. The transactions are very cheap. They're uh, confidential, the transactions. That's important to me. Uh, it runs very fast. Uh, their blocks are generated every one minute and two minute confirmations. So it's quick. It takes you, when you first peg into it, when you put your Bitcoin onto that uh, peg, it takes them about 102 confirmations and then it's yours. It's in the chain and you can start transacting with it. It's very easy to get it off. Now, uh, so what's the trade-off? If it works so well, what's part of the blockchain trade-off? Well, the trade-off is it's centralized. There are 15, I call them signatories, but uh, I think they're called functionaries in the uh, their world. But what it means is of those 15, 11 of them have to sign their wallet in order for things to move. Um, so you're giving up centralization again for this privilege. Now, I'm not concerned about that uh, in the sense that I don't believe these 15 functionaries are going to rug pull me. For one thing, many of them are well respected in the space and they, their reputation would, would be destroyed and they'd be, uh, they would actually be responsible for legal uh, ramifications. But it's a trade-off. I think we're going to see more and more trade-offs because if we want Bitcoin to scale, if we want it to be able to be usable by, like, say, your, your uncle, you know, Bitcoin maxis, I used to consider myself a maxi, but I'm, I'm really not. I don't know what you'd call it. Moderate, flexible, uh, progressive. I really don't care. But the idea that there's only one custody solution and it's a hardware wallet, air gap, cold storage, that doesn't work for me. For instance, is that going to work for like a 16-year-old kid? If you have any elderly relatives, are you going to use a hardware wallet for your 80-year-old grandfather? I'm not. <laughs> I'm not even sure at some point I'll trust myself with a hardware wallet and a seed phrase. And let's just say, let's just say that you're a maxi and you think that's the best way to go. And you've got 20 Bitcoin. You stick them all on your hardware wallet. Is there a counterparty risk to that hardware wallet? What if you get hit in the head next week and you forget your seed phrase? What if you, what if you put your seed phrase on a steel plate, which is smart? Where are you going to put the steel plate? Do you bury it in the backyard? Do you keep it next to the hardware wallet? Do you keep it in a safe deposit box? All of these things carry counterparty risk. Are you then going to use multi-sig? Multi-sig has risks, very much so. For instance, if are you going to use three? Are you going to use five wallets? And if you use five wallets, you know if you lose one of the end pubs, you're done. Your Bitcoin's gone. It, you might as well have burned it. So that's a counterparty risk. Uh, are you going to keep it on exchange? Absolutely, that's a risk. Are you going to trust it with BlackRock and the ETFs? What about the fact that they're all using Coinbase? You could mitigate the risk, put some in Fidelity or Bitwise. They do their own uh, custody. Bitwise also has proof of reserves, which is pretty cool. So what I'm trying to say is some people will look at me because I, I will tell you something. I use all of these solutions. I even own a MicroStrategy as a proxy for Bitcoin. It's the only equity that I own other than Bitcoin. And in my mind, it's almost like I'm looking at those 20 coins or however many you're looking at. And I'm putting them in buckets. And, you know, I keep very little Bitcoin. I don't keep any Bitcoin like in my residence. I keep on my wallet uh, that liquid. I keep enough that, you know, if I lose it or somebody takes my, I just don't really give a damn. So those are all ways to mitigate risk. What about, what about when I said, and it's coming, when, what about when banks are custodying Bitcoin and the bank tells you we have $250,000 FDIC insurance in the U.S. And so would it be stupid for me to take a couple of Bitcoin and put them in a bank where I know I can be reimbursed if those you know dipshits lose it? No, it's smart. Um, all these things are coming and they're all going to be changes that we get to witness. And it's going to happen fast. I, it's going to water our eyes. That's that, that's there are some great points in there because um, self custody or like where do you custody your Bitcoin and how do you custody your Bitcoin 
it's still there are so many questions to consider there's so many things to consider uh if you keep it on exchange you obviously have to counter by the risk if you keep it on an etf you have the same thing as on exchanges but if you have self-custody and you just have it on uh, one single SIG hardware wallet, obviously there's a lot of risk involved with that. Then you always want to have access to them. Um, you don't want to involve too many other people. You never want to also build such an amazing multi-signature hardware wallet uh, solutions where it's like a maze and you can actually don't even, you lock yourself out of your own Bitcoin. Uh, basically, like there are a lot of ways you can screw up. That That's for sure. <laughs> uh, so it's it's an, it's a question that you really have to, to get in there. Uh, and uh, I 100% think that even in a Bitcoin standard world, there will be Bitcoin banks, like there will be uh, a third party or a bank or whatever that takes care of your Bitcoin uh, the same way as, uh, as as people got care, uh, got their, their gold uh, cared for. But I love that we have the option of self-custody. Uh, I love myself self-custody. Uh, but think about all the attack vectors, like someone coming to your house, you don't want to have it in your house. Someone uh, hacking in your PC, it should not be on, uh, like, they are fi like there was also an episode uh, on my, where someone lost 25 Bitcoin. It was one of the very early episodes that I did, like in the, thing, I don't know, in the first like 20 or 30 episodes that I did. He lost 25 Bitcoin in self-custody because <laughs> uh, he had, uh, basically, on his computer, uh, a password manager, and there, there was uh, the passphrase in there, uh, the the seed phrase in there. So, like, there, there was a lot of things. Uh, there can a lot of things go wrong, and it's, it's. I don't want to make people fearful <laughs> when we talk like that, uh, but I also want to wake them up to the to the the thing that they actually have to care for that. Like, if you want to take responsibility of your Bitcoin. Don't just say it and buy a hardware wallet and put it on there. Really research about that, what you can do. Uh, and maybe even diversify, like keep some uh, uh, keep, keep some on different locations, different custody solutions. Um, yeah, maybe if you want to have some in your 401k, maybe have someone uh, on, on an ETF, maybe some in self-custody. Uh, it's, it's like the security is always an individual decision, individual, that there's not one size fits all <laughs> solutions that's i think that where where i really want to uh to go i also love that you mentioned uh the yield on bitcoin because there is no yield on bitcoin if you give away someone your bitcoin and he gives you a yield for that this means he's playing with your bitcoin <laughs> and you're betting on him <laughs> playing good and that's i think that's a bad bet <laughs> to, to take because how, how much better can, can it get like what does it do like of, of course he invests in altcoins of course he invests in other things uh, and that can turn out really badly ftx celsius even ftx did it unknown <laughs> you didn't even knew about it uh, so yeah, there's a, I love that you are also, um, uh, making people cautious about that. Um, one thing we did not touch on, uh, today, uh, at least not on a big way, um, you were a miner also, but now I, are you in, uh, in any way, shape or form also in Bitcoin mining? Like, uh, I think it was coal mining, uh, you did. So is, is, uh, is there any interest for you in, in mining Bitcoin, solo mining Bitcoin? Are you investing in anything like that? Well, I, I am because, again, it, I just wanted to try mining so that I could begin to study it and learn about that that structure, that infrastructure behind Bitcoin. Um, you know, mining is a brutal cutthroat operation. One of the things that's wonderful about mining is if you're doing mining, you can get non-KYC Bitcoin for yourself and put it into a wallet. But... For me, my lesson that I've learned from mining is that nothing is going to be able to beat the return and the risk-free return that is going to come from just buying Bitcoin, self-custodying Bitcoin, and sitting there on my hands and not losing the Bitcoin. You know, you mentioned, I do want to talk about something. You mentioned banks and uh, and the fact that you want to be your own sovereign bank too. And you know what's wonderful about a lot of the things that I just talked about is that the ultimate 
freedom that Bitcoin gives you is that you can put it on a wallet or you can memorize 12 words and you can go anywhere you want. You can cross any border border you want with your wealth. What do what do countries do when they're under duress? War, political conflict, uh, all kinds of of civil unrest. They in, they impose capital controls. So you might not be able to withdraw capital. You might not be able to uh, take your wealth with you. Your wealth might be confiscated. You saw that Italy just today. Uh, said they're going to increase capital gains on Bitcoin up uh, from 26 to 42 percent. Over and when that happens, you, if you're stuck there, that's going to be the regime. So you know what's wonderful about Bitcoin? You can come up to that border. You can have those 12 words in your head. They can strip search you. You know they can probe you. They can have a blast. They can make fun of you. They can send you across the border into your new country without any clothes on, but your skivvies. And you know what? When you're done, when you walk across the border, you can look back and flip them off and you basically own your own wealth still. That's a powerful thing. So you can still, some of these solutions that I'm talking about, or just, I don't know, these different things that are going to come along doesn't mean that you can't take that book Bitcoin and put it back where it belongs. Uh, it just means that for somebody my age and where I'm at, I see a lot of these things as solutions. And I, another thing, Robin, I want to talk about, because you mentioned this too, and it's really important. Yield, pursuit of yield has been a real problem for Bitcoiners. It, and it is where a lot of the losses have occurred. But going forward, there are going to be ways that you can earn a yield or maybe a return on your Bitcoin and it's a difficult concept to, to explain. But for instance, options markets. Okay, so option markets are coming for the Bitcoin ETFs. Well, there are going to be people that own a lot of Bitcoin or even some Bitcoin that are going to earn a, a premium on that Bitcoin by selling covered, uh, covered sells. So there will be a return on there. Just be aware of the fact that you are putting your Bitcoin at risk in this case, maybe you're somebody who wants to sell some Bitcoin at a very high price. So you're willing to let that premium rise up until it gets to your price and your Bitcoin's gone. The other thing is I mentioned uh, MicroStrategy and what's interesting about them is in their last uh, a quarterly report back in August, they announced something that I had not seen before. Now I've been investing in uh, MicroStrategy for years now and the reason was uh, initially I invested in it. It went way up. I got nervous. I sold it. And then it fell down. And I always thought to myself, well, why were you concerned about the rise in micro strategy? And it was because I didn't understand what the program was. But it became very clear to me as I began to study it that Michael Saylor and micro strategy had a game plan of what I call accretive dilution. And and I'm not coining this phrase because other people have talked about this. But for instance, what do most large companies that are sitting on large piles of cash, what, what do they do? United today just announced they're going to uh, take out $1.5 billion and they're going to buy back their stock. Now, if you went to United and said, hey, why don't you issue a billion and a half of stock and put it out there on the market? They would laugh at you because they know what would happen to their stock price. Um, what happened, you know, talking about options and, and what could happen in the future, what happened to GameStop, uh, as that stock exploded, uh, what did they do? They issued millions of shares and diluted the uh, outstanding shares and stopped that short seller, that gamma squeeze basically in a very short period of time. You know, one thing I will tell you for those people that are going to be on the insurance side of, of these options, the people that are selling these options, taking premiums, they are going to also have a come to Jesus moment when that when Bitcoin starts to accelerate and there's no one, no one can issue more Bitcoin stock. There's no GameStop that's going to come in here and, and put in more Bitcoin stock. That's it. 
they are going to see that thing rise and they're going to be forced into the market to purchase more as it continues up to cover themselves. Uh, we could see, even though volatility will probably be suppressed and options become a bigger part of the market, we're going to see explosive uh, movements. But getting back to MicroStrategy, so in this earnings call, they said, we're going to announce a new metric. It was a KPI, K, uh, that's key performance indicator. That's not new. But what they said was, this is a Bitcoin yield KPI. And, and here's how they explain it, which is something that I understood, but they put it in very plain terms. Our goal is to continue to acquire Bitcoin. And we are going to, it, we're going to acquire it primarily through debt. And in their convertible debt market, what do you see? You see somebody that is able to acquire $4 billion worth of debt at 80 basis points, 80 bips. That's for viewers that don't understand, that's less than 1% interest rate. How do they do that? And can anybody else do that? You can't do that. I can't do that. No company can do that, but but they can. And, and why is because of that, I'm tying this together with the discussion on options too, because convertible debt actually increases in value the more volatility there is with it. So Bitcoin's volatile. They, they're they acquiring Bitcoin. They told us that's our goal. And we're going to get more Bitcoin per, per share for our shareholders. Now you put this options trade on top of it. And guess what? They've got all kinds of liquidity coming in their market now because of this. So they've got liquidity. There are options. These options are like a leveraged Bitcoin call. And so that leverage skyrockets. And as it does, the option becomes worth more. And if you know bonds, when the bond's worth more, the yield, the, it goes down. Well, guess what? Their convertible debt is that's why they're able to borrow at these low rates. And then they just wash and repeat. So in that metric, they discuss this, but they also discuss guidelines going forward. You know, they're looking at over the next two quarters, a return. And I don't know if you want to use interest, yield, however you want to voice it. They're going to have a return projected as high as 8%. That means that for every Bitcoin that I have in there now, or proxy for the maxis, that means I'm going to have 1.25 Bitcoin in six months for every one of them. And there's no reason right now for this to stop. So when we talk about yield, we talk about interest, we talk about return, there are, there are many things that are happening in our space that that once again, just staying up by reading, educating yourself are going to help you a lot going forward. That's uh, it's super interesting. Uh, never thought about it in, in, in that way. Uh, really, really cool. Um, more general, when we go into Bitcoin future, when we think of like Bitcoin not right now or in a transition phase, when you really think about where Bitcoin is going, maybe you saw the internet rising, the DCPAP protocol, uh, that there was a dot-com bubble, and now we are at the stage where a lot of people, I think, I don't know, 5 billion people of the 8 billion people on Earth use the internet in some capacities. Like most of the people on Earth are uh, on the internet in, in some capacity. When you think about when, when do we get to the stage of Bitcoin that uh, Bitcoin being that mass adopted, being that mass adopted in the future, um, what does that look like? How do you foresee uh, that happening? Also, do you have some framework of like, okay, when do you think that that will happen? Will we get to the point where like almost everyone uses Bitcoin? indirectly or directly because uh, i think most people are not aware of like when they send a whatsapp message that there's like the internet involved in that so like most people don't like ah oh, I, do, I go on the internet no that they, they send a whatsapp message and i think uh, in that way also bitcoin will will spread how do you see bitcoin in in that really futuristic uh, way in like long term from now well i'll answer the 
I'll answer the last part first, because I think it's going to be a long time. I think that we're going to see that level of usage where everything's uh, your user interface, your UI experience is all beneath whatever it is you're using, whether it's an app, a hardware device, and you don't even think about it. You just, you know, you're sending your emails across the internet. So that level, I think that's quite a ways away. And, but the, the first part, you know, the, the adoption is happening. We have a lot of friction there that is probably going to make adoption more difficult going forward. Scalability is going to be one of those issues. Block space is going to be one of those issues. Now, it's nice to see a lot of developers now moving back to the Bitcoin space. I think that uh, the narrative has changed quite a bit on that. And I'm hopeful that we're going to see solutions coming forward. I think Fediment was a, a real, a big breakthrough in that too. But, you know, when you think about the average user and the average person, and you think about even internet access, Look at how limited internet access is around the world right now. Uh, we are very privileged. Look at you and I. I mean, look at what we're doing here. It, it's, it's a privilege. And most of the world, a large portion of the world, does not have that. You know, I can't remember the figures, but a large portion of Africa is without electricity or marginal electricity that's barely, you know, just spot of, in spots. So there are a lot of there's a lot of friction there. Um, and the other thing is, I, I'm not sure that, you know, Bitcoin has all the great facets that any money could have except one. But it had it runs rings around everything. Speaking of fidelity, they put out a wonderful chart that lists Bitcoin compared to other assets and as as money as a medium of exchange and bitcoin is the number one it's in the it's number one in the category except for longevity uh you know we don't have that millennia of use like say behind gold when we look at how most transactions are occurring in the world they're dollar based and i you know i i get probably pushback from some uh other people in the space but i think the dollar is going to be around for a long time uh, if you look at like uh, a lot of the hype around the BRICS currency and stuff, do you know that uh, uh, in international settlement, the Chinese yuan only accounted for 3% last year, 3%. So the majority of this settlement that's going on around the world is in dollars. And, you know, I personally envision a world where dollars are like a, a shit coin, basically you know, they're almost like my, for instance, when I went down to El Salvador, you know, I said, I told you I hadn't spent any Bitcoin, but I did down there. What I did is I loaded up a wallet uh, and just like fill and spend, fill and spend so that I could help their economy and keep things moving down there. I felt good about it, but I almost feel in the future, we're going to be viewing dollars like that. Like I have a certain amount of expenditures per month. That is what I'm going to use dollars for or whatever fiat currency there is. Let's say that I'm, let's say that the dollar uh, does lose reserve currency status and we come up with what used to be called uh, uh, in the Breton word, uh, woods, they had a name for the basket. It starts with a B, I can't remember it right now, but that's not important. Let's just say it's an, a basket of goods and there's a lot of things in there. Well, maybe that basket of goods will be what I use on my month to month expenditures. But what is Bitcoin going to be? Bitcoin is going to be that 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 store of value. It's going to be that final settlement layer for me. It's going to be my future wealth. It's going to be the most important thing that I have because again, it is the greatest monetary investment or invention in the history of mankind. That's not going away. It's just I think the adoption when I say it's going to explode over the next six to eight years, I'm not talking necessarily about global adoption. I just think that all these people that we have been front running, they're here and they get it. They're smart. I mean, they call them the smart money for a reason. And and they're here. They're with us on the platform and they're stepping on the train. <laughs>
<laughs> I loved it so much. And I had the discussion with Roger Sony, and I think it's very insightful. Uh, even if we had like a million dollar Bitcoin price, I think most people then still don't get Bitcoin. <laughs> I think I think most of the money comes in through institutional money, BlackRock, the the big uh, b b b big corporations now with buying Bitcoin. Uh, there's li there's literally uh, I saw more and more companies now buying Bitcoin and putting on a balance sheet, and even like the CEOs talking about that uh, on Twitter. And I have two interviews just next week lined up with CEOs of really big companies that decided to uh, go on a Bitcoin standard and they want to talk about also on the podcast about that. So the, this Michael Saylor micro strategy playbook <laughs> is really coming along. And if you think about it, if there has to be just like maybe 10, 20 people in the company, maybe even less depending on the size to really get Bitcoin, to, to make that step. Maybe if it's a big company that has way more people involved with that and the board of redactors and stuff like that, it's way more complicated. Uh, but I think the high prices of Bitcoin we reach, even though maybe the masses and uh, uh, our family gatherings, and if you go out on the street and ask like 20 people about Bitcoin, uh, two people maybe know about it. So high Bitcoin prices, are not correlated directly with the knowledge of Bitcoin in the in the general population, at least as I feel about it. Yeah, I, I think that you're you're probably spot on right there. Uh, you know, this idea of also AI. You know, we're talking about companies. Well, the future really is AI. It, to my, you know, to the Bitcoiners out there, if you have not used chat GBT, you need to sit down and, and do it because it will blow you away. Uh, not just the speed, but the in-depth analysis, the follow on questions that you can do. It, it is an incredible device. Well, you know, you're talking about the CEOs of large companies and Michael Saylor, his, that playbook that he developed, it, it's not unique to him. It could have been copied by other people but there have been things that have holding it back. For one thing, that FASB that I mentioned is one of the biggest issues. Well, that's done, January 1st, that's over. So the other thing is, imagine instead of you have a CEO on the comp your podcast, you have an AI entity, let's call him Bob. Bob is on the podcast, maybe he has an avatar that he wants to put on the screen. And what is Bob? Bob is the CFO for some real company. And this real company has told Bob, you know, we here's what we're going to do, Bob. We want to we're going to start a new uh, venture capital uh, capital fund, or we're going to just start a new uh, exploration to see if there's a market segment here. And what we want you to do is we're going to give you a budget, and we're going to give you a bunch of money, and we want you to hire people. Uh, we'll give you a you know we want you to rent a space, some physical space somewhere. Of course, Bob won't be there except on a screen. But you know what? Bob can have people meet there. He can arrange for purchase orders. He can arrange for equipment. He can arrange for the internet. He's going to start paying the utilities at space. Bob, the AI, is going to start doing all kinds of things. And what's he going to need? He's going to need money. And he's not going to be doing wire transfers. He's not going to be using that shit coin, the dollar. He's going to be using digital money. Now, I want it to be Bitcoin. And for developers, I hope that we are that internet based layer to AI. We may not be. I don't think CBDCs will be it only because there are so many, there's so many uh, blockades in front of CBDC adoption. But what if it's Tether? Oh, that's the other thing that I've been playing with on uh, uh, that wallet on Aqua Wallet is they also have uh, Tether on there, if I didn't mention it. So what if Tether is that base layer, layer? You know, why do you think Tether is so important around the world? It's because not just Bob the AI, but all the populations of the world that are under stress right now because of their currency, they want something, even if it's tied to the dollar, they want something that's better than what they have. And that is, for many of them, USDT. Um, it serves a really important role. And uh, this AI in the future, you know, Bob, the, he's going to be all over. And it won't just be the finance officer. At some point, there'll be independent Bobs. And they'll start working 
with Carol, another AI over at some other company or an independent firm. And they're going to be transferring value. How are they going to do that? It's going to be digital. I love, I love the, the, the AI inside here. I, 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 I think it's really, um, we are at the cusp of something really good and we are at the cusp of something we cannot even really imagine what happens. Uh, it's it's that, that big and that hard to imagine. Yeah, really, really cool. Um, I completely overlooked the time. We're already at over one hour um, and I love the, the, uh, the discussions already a lot. Uh, and we definitely have to do a second round on that because uh, this was uh, great till now. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast where I ask two questions. The one question is always the same for each guest. And the second is from the previous guest. The question that is always the same for each guest is what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Well, I, one of the things is that to never give up. I, uh, you know, if you think about the history that I told you, you know, it, it, it sounds like uh, I'm trying to be the most interesting person on in the world. That That's not really what I'm saying. What I'm really saying is that I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do in life. And I kept bouncing around because I couldn't find myself. I didn't know where I was. And some people would view that as a failure. Uh, and and I have failed at things in life, but I just kept going. It, it Like I kept trying. And it's so important. You know, I, I had a horrible experience um, back in 2004, which I don't really want to discuss. It's kind of personal, but it, it really shook me to the core. And there were times when I didn't want to get out of my bed in the morning. I would just stay there in my pajamas. But I, I realized that all I had to do was just get through the next five minutes, get through the next day, and then finally it was get through the next week. And then finally, I just kept going. So for any of you out there that have ever been in a really bad place, you know, I, I offer you hope. All you have to do is just keep going. If you'll just take that next step and don't succumb, you you never know where you're going to end up. I mean, look at myself, you know, I, I even after my brain injury, you know, that was a very difficult time. I walked around with a little three by five card in my pocket. And after I was done talking to somebody, I would, after they left, I would pull it out and I'd write down real quick who it was and what I talked about. So the next day, if I saw them, I could remember what it was. And, but I kept going. And so, and then look at today, you know, I, I am in a place I couldn't be happier. I'm, uh, you know, married to the love of my life. Uh, I, I'm, I've got enough in life. I'm happy, just like Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22. I can look around and I say, you know, I've got something that most people don't have. I have enough. And I just encourage people to really just stay focused on that idea of always, there's, there's always a tomorrow and just keep going. And I guess, I guess that's about it for, uh, just something I would leave people with. <laughs> I, I love that a lot. And, uh, we already also have the end routine of a previous guest asking a question for the next guest. And it's a similar question, actually, even though it's differently phrased. So maybe you already answered it, or, but maybe you have something new to add here. Um, the question from the previous guest who asked the question without knowing who, who you are, um, what's your identity besides being a Bitcoiner? And he asked that question and he asked me to give a little bit context to the question because he thinks Bitcoin will be boring at some point. <laughs> it isn't right now exciting and there's all those podcasts, but he will, he said like at some point, Bitcoin will be so boring as air or as, or as the TCP IP protocol. Uh, so at some point we have to have an identity besides being a Bitcoin maxi or besides being a Bitcoiner. Um, what is your identity right now besides being a Bitcoiner? I love this question. This is a great question. You know, um, I'm hopeful for the future in the sense to also that if you if you do what we talked about, if you just get Bitcoin, get your Bitcoin, hodl your Bitcoin, don't lose the Bitcoin, you are set in life. All you have to do is just live your life. If you've got a fiat paying job, just do that, pay the bills, whatever extra you have put into uh, Bitcoin. 
you know, and your wealth will increase. I, you know, I've been in Bitcoin for years. My wealth is increasing. You know, in my neighborhood, eight years ago, it took 600 Bitcoin to buy a house in my neighborhood. Now, in the next four years, that same house went up in value. And my neighbors were probably thinking, oh boy, my house went up. I'd say it was probably like maybe a hundred grand. And guess what? My, the, the Bitcoin that it took for me to purchase that same house was now 44 Bitcoin. So it went from 600 to 44. Do you know what it is today? It's seven Bitcoin to buy that same house. So, and, and coupled in with this question is why I'm, I mentioned this because I often post on Twitter, basically, you need to live your life. You've got to do something creative too. And what I mean is there are all kinds of creative arts. Now, obviously I love painting and, and you know, I'm a, a, a jack of all trades, masters of none, but except painting. I definitely am at a master's level of what I do in art. And, but you can do something creative in all forms of your life. I think that sometimes when I see, when I see a plumber come to my house, I had one last year, I felt like he was a craftsman, like it was a, that he was an artist. And I, I know that sounds silly, but the way to watch him bend copper pipe and the way he would sweat the joints on, it was incredible. And when it was done, it looked beautiful. And I told you, I used to love to weld like that chopper, but I would look at somebody who knew what they were doing and I would almost cry to see their weld. That's an artist. Do something creative, whether it's creating podcasts, whether it's doing writing, whether it's just something that you've always wanted to do. I highly encourage you to do something creative. I, I love that so much. And uh, I want to, <laughs> I just want to put the emphasis on what you just said with the Bitcoin and, uh, and the, the real estate also, because I think that's something that's really, really an insight, especially for those people who, who still hold a lot of real estate and are still really uh, invested in, in, in real estate. Because yes, real estate probably will always go up against fiat currencies, but measured in Bitcoin, like this 600 Bitcoin, to seven Bitcoin, that's a 98.84% uh, uh, down for us. That, that's a complete crash of the real estate market in Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and why are people doing that? Because, you know, it's been the playbook over the last decades. And if you look at wealthy people, what is the one, there's one thing that ties most wealthy people together. They own real estate. They own rental properties. They own real estates just as second, third, fourth, there are some that own five homes without a blinking an eye. There are people that are using that real estate to try and keep that deflation of their currency. They're doing or debasing of their currency, doing everything they can to keep their wealth intact. Well, I just told you there's a solution. You don't need real estate anymore. Real estate has so many counterparty risks. I know we're close uh, to the end of time here, but uh, you know, if you were to list all the real estate risks, they're, they're incredible. You know, you have zoning risks from whether it's the state, local, federal zoning risks. In the U.S., the federal government came in and said, guess what? If you're a home, if you're a, if you are a landlord, you can't evict renters. They can, they can just stop paying you. There's risk in, uh, weather. There's risk in insurance premiums. They're skyrocketing. You know that plumber I just told you about? You call that plumber today and guess what? He costs twice as much as he did four years ago. That's a counterparty risk. There's county party risk. There's opportunity cost. We haven't even discussed that. Think about what the opportunity cost is of not owning Bitcoin. Over the last five years, Bitcoin has returned 53%, I think. 53%. That's a hurdle rate. That's an opportunity cost. Go ahead and put your money in real estate, but you are missing out. I, I will say that for another discussion. And I also want to talk a little bit about physical security sometime because th that's going to change too go, coming up. And there's things that I do to uh, protect myself, but we'll hold that. So 
Uh, what else, Robin? Really cool. I love it a lot. Really cool. Um, the only thing that I need from you before we, we go off, um, where can people find you, ask you questions and, and reach out to you if they have questions for you? Um, you know, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm just listed as George Bodine. Uh, I think if you type that in there, in fact, if you just type my name in Google, I think I'm the first thing that comes up uh, as an artist or something that lists me. But um, that that's probably the best way to get in touch. Now, you mentioned a, a, a question. Do I get to uh, give a question then for the next guest? Yes, uh, you get, I usually do it offline, but if you want, you can also do it right now uh, if you have I, one, but yeah, usually I, wanna, I do it offline. I want to do that because it's something that came up recently. I already know my answer, but what I'd like to ask the next guest is, if you look in the back of the studio, I've got a door back there. It leads to a changing room for the models. So if you knew behind that door that Satoshi was standing there and you would be able to know who he was, would you open that door and and follow up? If you open that door, would you tell anybody? I love that a lot. Uh, open it uh, for Satoshi. Wow. I, I love that question a lot. Um, it's a really, really good one uh, because I, I think the mystery and the magical thing about Satoshi is that we don't know who it is. A lot of, a lot of value that Bitcoin right now has is actually from uh, we don't know the creator. There's no one to attack. Like there's not a single person that anyone can really attack. People attack Michael Saylor, people attack individual Bitcoiners, of course, but Michael Saylor does not speak for Bitcoin. Nobody speaks for Bitcoin. Uh, the closest figure for that would be Satoshi Nakamoto, even though he is now so long away that he, even if he reappears, probably does not really speak for Bitcoin. But I think he would be such an important figure that it was, would have kind of appeared that he would he would speak for Bitcoin. And there are so many nice documentation with HBO now and then all the <laughs> drama around who is Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, I honestly like, don't even watch that because I, I, I really don't care about, about that. But it's fun to speculate around. It's fun to talk about that. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a fun question. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for, for giving that to the next guest. Spot, he, he will spot have a lot on, of fun with Robin. <laughs> spot on. Really cool. Thank, thank you so much, um, uh, George, for being on. Uh, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening uh, to this episode for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Bye, Robin. <laughs>